been on a journey from Genesis to Revelation. We're taking 12 weeks to survey the entire Bible. Uh, We've spent the last eight weeks in the Old Testament, and this morning we step into the New Testament. We step into the Gospels. The reality is that Jesus stepped into the created realm. He stepped into creation uh, on that first Christmas morning uh, in a... uh, in a season of turbulent times, like, like the, so, uh, economically, uh, ancient Israel, when Jesus stepped in, was in terrible state. People were starving. Um, politically, uh, Jesus stepped into turbulent times. I mean, good grief, the Roman government, what was this heavy-handed governing authority uh, that was, uh, was in charge and there's some history to that. I'm going to review that in just a moment for you. Uh, he, he, uh, when Jesus stepped into history, these were turbulent times. There were times when, when family traditions were being up, up, upturned. Like the things that, that you could count on for decades could no longer be counted on. And maybe as I describe that, you can relate. You can relate. Here's kind of a quick orientation. Here's... here's 2,000 years in four minutes, okay? Um, I, I, I put a, a timeline up for us last week. I've modified it for you this week. Um, and put it up on the screen if you would, Bria, please. Um, uh, 2,000 BC, uh, 2000 BC uh, we've got, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, here, I'll go over here. There we go. I can see what's going out online, just so you know, friends at home. I can see what's going out online. And so I have to be kind of responsive to what's going on on screen here. Uh, 2,000 years ago, they will go this way. Let's see, can I point at that? Yeah, I'm almost pointing right at Abraham right there. How about that? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But roughly 2,000 BC, there's a bit of the, uh, historical discussion about exactly the dates. Um, uh, Moses uh, came, prophet of God, um, 1450 BC, 1280, came can be made for either of those places, either of those times. So you get kind of the late Bronze Age. We can date King Saul and David very accurately, 1000 BC. Uh, David's son Solomon died in 930 BC. Um, and what followed, and we're into the Iron Age at that point, but what followed then was um, upheaval in ancient Israel and a division. Uh, of, the, of the nation of Israel so that the northern ten tribes took the, the name Israel, made their capital city Samaria. The southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin took the name of Judah and, and the capital city of Jerusalem. And they never united again. Uh, what, what follows then is um, superpower after superpower marching through and clobbering the land. Um, the, the Assyrians came and conquered the northern tribe of Israel, the northern ten tribes of Israel, um, in uh, 732, and then they came back because they hadn't clobbered them quite enough, and and in 701, like, they devastated the place. Um, The south then was conquered by the next world power, the Babylonians, uh, 598, and then again in 587, same deal, didn't clobber them quite hard enough the first time. And, And God would use these superpowers to bring correction to his people and then uh, each superpower would receive, be judged uh, for their own, for their own grievous um, uh, abuses. Uh, Persia came to power. Uh, phenomenal story of how that came to be. Uh, 539, and they overtook the Babylonian kingdom, had a new sort of management policy, and they sent nations that had been conquered previously back to uh, the places that they had um, they'd come from. And so you begin, have the beginnings of a migration back to Jerusalem. This is the era of Queen Esther. Um, this is the era of uh, Ezra the priest. Uh, this is the era of Nehemiah, uh, the, the king's uh, representative uh, as uh, they in the 400s uh, B.C., came back. The temple was rebuilt. Uh, Not quite as impressive as Solomon's temple, but it was rebuilt. And then the walls under Nehemiah were rebuilt. And surely, surely, now this was the time when God would grant Israel the kind of peace that she was looking for, the kind of economic prosperity that they'd enjoyed under uh, the reign of Solomon, uh, the kind of military strength that they enjoyed under the time of of David. Um, and, And yet, And yet the the political intrigue, the machinations, the the conquering, uh, yet it continued yet again. 
Uh, the Jewish leaders uh, determined, uh, they recognized that uh, the judgment of these nations was brought by God, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians. Um, so uh, let's, let's double down on our obedience to God. If God is judging us for our disobedience, let's double down on our obedience to God and let's, 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 let's by gum, let's make sure that this doesn't happen again. And that's kind of the attitude in what we call it the post-exilic period. It's, it's that following the exiles, uh, the na- nation of Judah returned and, and, and the leader said, look, we're going to make sure that this doesn't happen again and, and, and began to oppose rules, like they added rules to the rules um, in order to make sure that people didn't screw it up again. But the Greeks came under Alexander the Great um, and uh, 336 BC, uh, he overtook the Persian Empire and, uh, and the result was more severe oppression of the people of Israel. Uh, Alexander the Great died unexpectedly and his generals kind of took over uh, rule and, and you've got a period of history then that, that, that is turbulent. Uh, under Judas Maccabeus, uh, there, there was actually a pushing back and there's about a hundred year period uh, where uh, Israel had sort of self-governance. Mm, kind of depends on how you define self-governance, but, but different parts of that 100 year period um, was there. But then in 63 BC, so this is 60 years before the coming of Jesus, uh, the Romans come and, and they conquered the land. And in 37 BC, Herod the Great uh, was, was named king. Uh, they call him the Great, not because he was a nice guy at all, <laughs> uh, but because uh, he, he undertook enormous building campaigns. And if you have the privilege of visiting Israel uh, sometime in your lifetime, you can, you can see them, you can experience them. It's a phenomenal experience. Some of these structures uh, that he built in, in the, the midst of his reign. This is the setup for the coming of Jesus political intrigue, economic upheaval, oppression of people uh, that is, is horrific by modern standards. And, and, and these are the opening pages of the New Testament. So this morning what I wanna do is I just wanna kind of run through, Here, here's the outline. If you wanna download it to your, uh, to your smartphone or your, or your uh, tablet, um, you can do that. Just go to the Okotoks Alliance Church app Click the top button, the green one, um, the online button, and you'll see on the right-hand side uh, is our sermon notes. Pull them down, look at them on your phone, copy and paste them into something you're taking notes in, um, but it's there. But here's the outline this morning. We're gonna look at the, the structure of the Gospels. I, I think this is gonna be helpful for, helpful for you. Remember, we're, we're trying to orient ourselves. How does the Bible fit together? Well, what's the connection? Genesis through Revelation. So we're going to look at the structure of the Bible. We're going to look at at the people uh, of the Gospels. So the structure of the Gospels. I don't think I said that quite right. The people of the Gospels and the places of the Gospels and then the message of the Gospels. So a bit of orientation to us this morning. We're talking about the Gospels. That's the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And and each of them tells us about Jesus. Uh, They do so from a different perspective. Uh, Each author wants us to know more than just the bare historic facts. Uh, They have have an agenda. They want us to follow. Information they want us to track with. And and so they want us, and and in particular, they want us to, to understand and encounter God through the presence of Jesus. Through the coming of Jesus that we would understand and encounter God himself. Uh, And and that's my prayer for us this morning, that we would encounter him, encounter God in his word, uh, even as we examine it. They want to see us recognize that Jesus in his coming was the fulfillment of the ancient hope that we've been talking about. He was the fulfillment of this prophetic thread that begins in Genesis and flows right up until the New Testament. And these writers want us to see in that that Jesus is the big idea of the pages of Scripture. Uh, He is the one the entire Old Testament has been looking forward to. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, these first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, um, they're named after guys who had a, a personal connection to Jesus in one way or another. So Matthew and John were disciples of Jesus. They literally walked with Jesus. They were among the twelve. Mark was this young guy who we're pretty sure shows up in his own gospel as this teenager who's kind of hanging around the disciples. I can tell you about that another time. 
He becomes a, a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul for a short period of time, referred to in the, in the act, book of Acts as John Mark. Um, uh, he eventually then finds himself in the company of the Apostle Peter, one of the closest of Jesus' companions, one of the 12. Um, and, and the Gospel of Mark is, is thought to basically be Peter's narration of what took place, but penned through Mark. Now, the Gospel of Mark is, is almost certainly the first of the Gospels to have been written, A.D. 65. Shortly after that, uh, Matthew wrote his gospel, and what's kind of interesting is most of the gospel of Mark shows up in Matthew and in Luke. Kind of seems like they used Mark's work to kind of, as their starting point, to then expand on what they then brought. Matthew bringing his content from the perspective of having walked with Jesus. Uh, Luke is almost certainly a Greek author. So these guys are Jewish that have been writing. So, so Luke brings a very different perspective. He came to be the traveling companion uh, of the Apostle Paul. Uh, I'm gonna introduce you to Paul next Sunday as we look at the first century uh, of the church um, you know, through the pages of the New Testament. Um, uh, Luke tells us kind of straight up at the beginning of his gospel that he gathered the content of this through uh, extended interviews with the eyewitnesses who were present around the time of Jesus. Uh, here's how the Gospel of Luke uh, begins. Luke chapter one, verse one. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So think about this. Um, Luke uh, was not Jewish, uh, or, or if he was, he was a convert to Judaism uh, because all the evidence suggests that he was Greek. He has come to faith in Jesus, and now he's writing to a guy named Theophilus. Now, we don't really know who Theophilus was. Some have suggested maybe he was a patron who had kind of paid for some of the Apostle Paul's travels. Uh, others have suggested that uh, the, the word Theophilus may actually be a way of describing sort of brothers, you know, the theos. Uh, there's there's some, something in the Greek there. I didn't say that quite right. Don't quote me on the theos piece. Um, my Greek isn't good, that, that good. Um, but he tells us that he's made a careful investigation and that his intent is to write what he calls an orderly account for us. So if we were just to kind of do a little comparison of uh, the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew, it, we, we start to get a bit, a bit of an idea of how these Gospels differ. Matthew, for instance, tells us about the coming of Jesus as does Luke. They both do. We're going to be on the Christmas season before we know it, and we'll be going to Matthew and Luke. Matthew tells us about the gospel, about, about the coming of Jesus, um, more focused, it seems, on Joseph's experience of it. Uh, he begins by, by telling us about uh, Joseph's family tree, the family lineage, and, and we begin really early on to recognize Matthew seems to be writing to a Hebrew crowd trying to convince them that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He has come for them. And he does that in several ways. Uh, uh, he quotes Old Testament prophecies as having been fulfilled by the coming of Jesus. Um, and, and, and this is significant to him. He tells us, for instance, about uh, Herod's massacre of the little boys around Bethlehem. Um, and then he, he tells us about the Holy Family's flight to Egypt. Now in all of that, uh, he says, this, was, this happened in the fulfillment of Old Testament expectation, Old Testament prophecy. So, so Jewish readers are gonna be particularly interested in this kind of information. Now Luke, on the other hand, tells us about the coming of Jesus, but he seems to have done so often through the eyes of Mary. So, so remember he said he did extensive interviewing. Um, Mary seems to be one of the people that he interviewed because he, he tells us 
things that we otherwise might not have known. He talks about uh, the miraculous birth of a guy named John the Baptist. Well, we find out that his family's connected to Mary's family um, in a, a very uh, particular way. Um, Mary tells us, uh, or he tells us about the angel visiting Mary, and we say, well, that seems to have come because he's interviewed Mary and is telling, retelling what she told to him. Uh, he tells us about the, um, uh, Jesus in a couple of boyhood stories, uh, boyhood accounts of what Jesus was doing. That's in the Gospel of Luke, and it seems to be because of where he's been getting some of his information. So that's just a little, that's just kind of a superficial overview to some of the differences in the structure of the Gospels, each one written from a different perspective, uh, all pointing to Jesus as the, the one uh, who's the big picture of history. He's the, spe the one specifically the Old Testament has been anticipating, yet all of history has been looking forward to the one who would come and his name is Jesus. And the Gospels, all four of them, are inviting us as readers to believe in Jesus. To, to, to believe all of this about Jesus, to put our faith in Jesus, to secure our present and our future, now and through eternity, because we place our hope in Jesus, because we believe what Jesus says. He's come as the long-promised Savior, and he will save you if you will do that, if you will put your hope and your trust in him. So that's a bit about, about the structure. So what about the people that we encounter in the Gospels? If you've not read through the Gospels, it might be helpful to get a little who's who in the zoo um, orientation to what's going on. So the Apostle John, in his Gospel, gives us a particularly intimate introduction to individuals. As you read through the Gospel of John, one of the distinctives there is, is the fact that he introduces us to, to individuals. So right near the beginning, John 4, he introduces us to a woman who's had a brutal life. It has been a horrific existence. She's had five failed marriages, and the, 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 she's living common law then uh, with a sixth man, and, and all of that, the sub-narrative that it really doesn't tell us the details, but you're like, oh my goodness, that must have been a painful existence for this woman. And yet, she's asking spiritual questions, and she encounters Jesus at the well, and in that encounter, her life is utterly transformed, radically transformed, and with that, the people in her town are transformed as well. Uh, John introduces us to uh, some people who were healed by Jesus, but he just doesn't, doesn't just tell us about the healings, he gives us some of the backstory to who they were and what was going on in their lives. I think this is maybe why uh, many people uh, find the Gospel of John a great introduction to the work of Jesus. Uh, often he's, it, it's just a, an accessible kind of personal introduction. These are real people. They've encountered Jesus in a very real way, and that encounter is transforming their lives. But there are some categories of people that it's maybe also helpful to be introduced to. Um, uh, one of those categories of people would be the religious leaders uh, that we uh, are introduced to. Um, uh, these are the people whom Jesus levels his harshest criticism towards, the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Um, these are the people who, in the post-exilic period, they doubled down, that they were going to make sure that people kind of towed the line, forcing people to be obedient to the law, follow the rules, and we find out that it's resulted in what, in, in, in what God does not want. Um, it's resulted in, in some who do a particularly good job in their own opinion uh, of following the, the rules, and they're very proud of it. <laughs> the, the, it results in a prideful, self-righteous uh, reality. Um, uh, there are others who end up living in, in shame and self-loathing uh, because they just never can measure up to any of the rules that seem to be there. Now, the religious leaders were not happy about the criticism that Jesus leveled at them, um, and they became particularly hostile toward Jesus and ultimately are responsible for his execution. So who's who in the zoo? Um, uh, we, we hear about priests. They're part of the religious leadership, particularly responsible for the temple. Chief priest, high priest, kind of intuitive who they were. We, we were introduced to scribes uh, or experts in the law. 
This is a really fascinating group of professionals who who arose during that post-exile period of Israel history. They became those that would gather together the the ancient writings, um, put them into shape and form. Uh, They made sure that they they duplicated faithfully and carefully uh, the the Old Testament law, the prophets, uh, Proverbs, uh, the Psalms, uh, so that every synagogue could have their own copy of uh, these texts. Uh, They're the group who uh, engaged in a translation of the Hebrew scriptures into uh, the Greek of the day. Uh, We refer to it as the LXX or or the Septuagint. It's an extremely valuable resource to us as students of scripture. Uh, This is a group that we actually owe an awful lot to. Uh, they, they, had a, they were used by God in significant ways to preserve the integrity of the Old Testament scriptures for us. And yet by the time we meet them in the pages of the New Testament, uh, they too are adversaries to Jesus. Uh, they are standing against him. Uh, so that's the priests, that's the scribes, the experts in the law. The Pharisees are another group. This is by and large a uh, kind of a, a lay group. They're, they're not professionals. They're unpaid men who have kind of agreed to associate together, become part of the club uh, that is going to make sure that people toe the line. Uh, like they, they just saw people being sloppy all over the place with the uh, religious law, adherence to the law, and they were going to fix this. Uh, I've sometimes imagined them to be a little bit uh, like you know, the Masonic Lodge or the Shriners. You know, they wore funny hats, uh, they have little sh- secret handshakes and codes and uh, secret society-like behavior uh, that they intended to then impose on, uh, on others. Uh, next week, we'll be, I'll introduce you to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was part of the Pharisees' club. That's part of who he was. Um, Jesus, in particular, is harsh on this group because there's such hypocrisy present uh, in uh, the difference between what they do and what's going on inside. So that's kind of just a short introduction to the religious leaders. Now, the great tragedy in that is, of all the people that you would encounter in the pages of Scripture who, 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 who... you would have expected, who did uh, want to welcome the Jewish Messiah when he came. Of all the people that would have high expectations and you would anticipate being utterly responsive to the Messiah when he came, surely this group of leaders were, were that. And yet when Jesus did not meet their expectations, they turned and became adamant in their opposition to that which they most wanted. It's, it's, it's tragic as you read through the pages of Scripture. So that's a little bit about the leaders that we meet in the Gospels. Uh, There's another group that we meet in the Gospels that are often referred to as the crowd. The crowd. Um, uh, Sometimes there were hundreds, sometimes there were thousands uh, uh, that were gathered as part of the crowd. Most of the crowd were ordinary people. They were they were farmers, they were merchants. uh, uh, There were some political zealots. Uh, They were looking for a military solution to the political oppression of Rome. Um, they, They were willing to take up arms in order to see Israel freed yet again. They would hearken back to the era of Judas Maccabeus just 150 years before and say, ha, uh, make Israel great again, <laughs> and uh, would anticipate doing so. So uh, there are community leaders that are part of the crowd. Uh, there were uh, even some occasional Roman, sh- Roman soldiers uh, showed up as part of the crowd. The crowd, as, as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John introduce us to them are constantly being called to respond to the message of Jesus. Um, uh, Do you believe the things that Jesus is saying? Well, then do something about it. Uh, Do you believe the miracles that Jesus is working? Well, then respond to them. Uh, Do you believe Jesus? Well, it's time to follow Jesus and, and trust the balance of your life to him Uh, This side of death and right through eternity. Do you want to know what's on the other side of death? Trust Jesus. Walk with him. And each of the gospel writers is asking his readers uh, to identify themselves in the midst of the narrative that they present. Where are you? Uh, Are you you like uh, the religious leaders? Uh, Is there hypocrisy evident in your life that needs to change? Are are you like the crowd? Some have just gathered for the spectacle. Jesus is a lot of fun to watch. Um, uh, Others have come with with genuine spiritual seeking, and and, and some come with desperate need 
And it seems that they, in particular, are the ones who encounter the power of Jesus and his, his life-transforming presence. Some ultimately find themselves drawn to Jesus in particular. And this is another group that we encounter. So we've got the leaders, we've got the crowd, we've got the disciples. Those who have said in some way, shape, or form yes to Jesus. They're, they've been responsive to Jesus. Um, there are at least kind of three circles that this, the Gospels describe for us uh, in this group of leaders. There's the 72. Uh, Jesus sent them out in twos uh, to do the things that he had done. Um, uh, there, there's a, another group that's like, like referred to as the 12. And these are particularly close. The 72 may have come and gone, you know, maybe planted a crop and then came and hung out with Jesus for a while. The, the 12 kind of gave up everything and, and left dad with the fishing boats and, and uh, left you know, the, the family farm and they came. Uh, Matthew was one who was a tax collector, left that business behind and they came to devote themselves to following Jesus. Rabbi Jesus, teacher Jesus, we want to learn from you. Of the 12, Peter, James, and John become kind of the closest to Jesus. They seem to be like a group of three. Um, often the gospel writers tell us about what took place, the dialogue that happened between, those, uh, the, between Jesus and these three guys. Uh, of these three, uh, Peter would write the gospel of Mark through his protege, Mark. Um, James would become the leader of, the first leader of the Jerusalem church. Um, martyred in the book of Acts. We'll talk about that next Sunday. Uh, John, the youngest of the 12, uh, would, uh, would outlive all the others, uh, would live pretty much to the end of the first century, uh, having written uh, the Gospel of John, uh, three letters, first, second, third John, uh, the book of Revelation. So it gives you a little, and this, we're flying high over this, I realize this, but it gives you a bit of an orientation to the structure of the Gospels, to the people of the Gospels, and, and I think this may be helpful to have a little orientation to the, place, uh, the places in the Gospels as well. Uh, Jesus lived his entire life never straying more than about 200 kilometers from where he was raised, uh, Nazareth. I've got a map here that um, we'll throw up for you. And uh, uh, this is just a kind of a part map of the region of Palestine or Judea. Um, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Now, that's down below where my map uh, is here. Down, I get my hand the right way for the folks at home. Um, uh, it's down below. Uh, Bethlehem was basically a suburb of Jerusalem. Um, the Holy Family fled to Egypt, which is further south. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to travel to Egypt uh, and visit a Coptic church uh, in and around Cairo, uh, around anywhere along the, um, the Nile River. Uh, there's lots of fabulous stories that have been preserved where they talk about the journey of the Holy Family. Some of it may be historical. Um, some of it's probably not. Uh, but it's, it's a really, really cool experience. Um, you'll recall the Christmas account of how Joseph had dreams, okay? So Matthew tells us about this in particular. He had dreams where God directed him. Go to Egypt, save the child, time to come back to Palestine, to Judea. Came back, uh, made the choice to go to Nazareth. Felt that that was a safer political environment in Nazareth than it was in Jerusalem or Bethlehem. And so Jesus, and, and Matthew says, in all of these choices, uh, uh, Old Testament prophecy was being fulfilled. Jesus lived the majority of his life around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, on the sea, we have accounts, around the sea. He moved to Capernaum, and Capernaum kind of became on the, on the north shore of the sea. I get my hand the right way here. Uh, no, I lose my arm on the, on this, on the graphic. Um, on, the, on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee is the, the, the community of Capernaum. You can visit that there today. Peter's mom had a home there. Um, Jesus would have lived in that space. It's, it's, it's a remarkable experience. Um, and then Jesus ministered around that area. He went as far north as Tyre, um, up on the north on the Mediterranean Sea, uh, went down to Jerusalem probably four times um, in his ministry years, and then ultimately was executed um, on his final trip to Jerusalem. So, so that's, that's a little bit about the structure, the people, and the places that we find in the Gospels. But what about the message? What about the message of the Gospels? Now, we've been talking about this as we've been going along. But the Gospels want us to know that Jesus... Is God come among us as a fulfillment of the ancient pro prophetic promise that God, God is intervening in history 
Uh, he is doing something extraordinary in our broken world. And, and the most extraordinary thing is he's fixing the terminal problem of sin. It was, it, it, it's clear in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then it becomes utterly clear in the Gospel of John uh, that Jesus, the Savior, the promised Messiah, was indeed God himself come among us. Um, listen to John recounting Jesus' words, John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. So Matthew recounts Jesus' words uh, that in his coming, uh, so that was John. Matthew recounts Jesus' words that in his coming, uh, he is fulfilling the Old Testament law and prophets. In other words, in other words he is uh, meeting all of the requirements that the law and the prophets had. And he's saying that, that all of the Hebrew scriptures point to him, point to Jesus. Scholar and author, Dr. Don Carson, D.A. Carson, uh, in his book, The God Who Is There. Uh, he tells the story about uh, his undergraduate studies at uh, McGill University in Montreal. And uh, while he was an undergraduate, he befriended uh, a, a Muslim man who was there doing his PhD studies uh, in Islamic studies at McGill. And uh, in the course of the friendship, began to realize that his, his Muslim friend was trying to convert him to Islam. Uh, Carson grew up, his dad was a pastor. Um, uh, he eventually would do extended scholarly studies, become one of the, the preeminent uh, New Testament scholars of our era. Uh, still alive today, 70 years of age or something like that. Um, so Carson decided, well, I'll, I'll return the favor and uh, share about Jesus with my Muslim friend. And uh, gave him a, a, a copy of the scriptures, uh, invited him to read it, and he was. Uh, came the Christmas when he invited his Muslim friend back to Hull for Christmas with the family. Uh, so Hull on the, uh, the Quebec side of the border uh, adjacent to Ottawa. And, um, and, and listen to how Carson describes this next portion of the story. He says, I asked to borrow the family car so I could take Muhammad, that's his friend, to see some of the sites in the capital city. We went here and there and we ended up at our parliament buildings. In those days, there was much less security than there is now. <clears throat> we joined one of the guided tours, 30 of us being led around the buildings so the rotunda at, to the rotunda at the rear where the library is, to the Senate chambers, to the House of Commons, to the rogues gallery of Canadian prime ministers from Sir John A. Macdonald down and so forth. We finally returned to the central foyer, which is circled by some large pillars. At the top of each pillar is a little fresco where there is a figure, and the guide explained as he pointed from one figure to the next, there is Aristotle, for government must be based on knowledge. There is Socrates, for government must be based on wisdom. There is Moses, for government must be based on law. He went all the way around, and then he asked, any questions? My friend piped up, and he said, where is Jesus Christ? And the guide did what guides do under such circumstances. They simply say, I, I beg your pardon? So Muhammad did what foreigners do under such circumstances. They assume that they have been misunderstood because of their thick accent. So he articulated his question more clearly and more loudly. Where is Jesus Christ? Now, there were three groups in the foyer of the Canadian Parliament listening to a Muslim a Pakistani Muslim, ask where Jesus was. I was looking for a crack in the ground to fall in. I had no idea what, where that was coming from. And finally, the guide blurted out, why should Jesus be here? Muhammad looked shocked. Picking up a line from the Bible verses he had been reading, he said, I read in the Christian Bible that the law was given through Moses, but the grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Where is Jesus Christ? 
The guide said, I don't know anything about that. I muttered under my breath, preach it, brother. Do you see how it looked to Muhammad? He was a Muslim. He understood about a God who has laws, who has standards, who brings terror, who sits in judgment over you, a God who is sovereign and holy and powerful. He understands all that. But he had all already been captured by Jesus, full of grace and truth who displays his glory profoundly on the cross and becomes the meeting place between God and sinners because he dies the sinner's death. Jesus' coming was an extraordinary, unprecedented, unparalleled event in all of human history. Uh, Jesus' coming would, would be in fulfillment of the Old Testament expectation. Matthew, Matthew yearns that we would see that. And Jesus' coming would do another very important thing. As promised by the Old Testament prophets, Jesus' coming would be the initiation of a new covenant agreement with humanity. Uh, Jesus uh, would enable any who would follow him to actually become obedient, faithful followers of God through his obedience. Jesus was the second Adam who would not fail as the first Adam had done. Uh, Jesus would be uh, like the prophet Moses, but without his imperfections. Uh, Jesus would come as part of the line of King David, but he would be the king who would not fail his people nor his God. And Jesus is the one who, as he steps into the midst of a turbulent world history, would say, come and follow me. Secure your faith in God the Father through the work of the Son, enabled by the one I will send, who is the Holy Spirit. And it was this new covenant that he was establishing on the night that Jesus was betrayed. Let me read it for you from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you're a follower of Jesus, we do what Jesus said. We observe this again until he comes. But maybe you would take the bread and we would eat it in remembrance of the one who has come for us, creator of the new covenant, our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's us eat together. And Luke tells us that in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. If you're a follower of Jesus, let's us take the cup and drink together. Luke goes on, he says, but the hand of him who's going to betray me is with mine on the table. Apparently the turbulent days were not over because Jesus had come. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Turbulent times. Even for the followers, the followers of Jesus. And yet they would fix their eyes on him and they would step into uh, the next decades of the first century of the church. We're gonna look at that next Sunday. Matthew and Mark tell us that after they had observed the Lord's table for the first time, it says that they, they sang a hymn and then they went out. So I wanna invite Tim and the team to lead us in the singing, of, uh, uh, in, singing in response. 
Uh, and I'll invite those present to stand. If you're at home, you're welcome to stand as well, of course. As, uh, and Tim, I'll, I'll turn it over to you.